Okay, so last year, around January, I uh, know, around December, the year before last, yeah, around December last year, I started to work with Snacks. And Snacks are applicable to two major things um, for privacy and for scalability. So today I'm going to talk about two applications to privacy and one application to scalability. Um, so the privacy projects are called Mixumus and Semaphore. So Mixumus is a, is a, is a generic uh, Ether and ERC20 token mixer where you can deposit one Ether and later you can withdraw one Ether and there's no way to connect the deposit to the withdrawal. And Semaphore is, it fall, is a very similar architecture and we use that to do, um, to, to do general reputation mixing. Yeah, so, so you, can, you can become part of a group and you can signal things about your thoughts or beliefs or other things and no one can connect. All people will know is that you're a member of that group. And then we also have some rate limiting things there as well so that we can do like uh, cooler public systems. And then we'll talk about snacks for scalability. It's okay, you can come in. And we'll talk about we'll talk about snacks for scalability. Um, so so basically, we'll we'll build an elliptic curve inside the snack, and we'll use that to make signatures, and we'll use that also to do Patterson commitments. And then we then we sort of join that all together to make something called rollup, where well, and how what rollup is is rollup aggregates transactions together in order to. Uh, it, it aggregates transaction validation. So instead of having to, uh, to, to verify 10,000 signatures inside the EVM, you have to verify a single pr snark proof. Um, you can come in, it's okay. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, so so then so that's that's what we use we use um, that's what rollup is. Yeah, it's just a um, it's a scalability solution. Okay, so first, what is a snark? Okay, so a snark is a snark is a way of proving that you did a computation without uh, to, the, to proving of uh, proving that you did a computation correctly. Yeah, so the verification of a snark is succinct. Oh wait, I'll say that later. So g given given some inputs and some code that we predefined before, we'll get some outputs. Yeah, that's what, that's what a snark proves. Yeah? Prove that we run the code with the inputs and got the outputs. Yeah? But then we can do cool things, right? We can sort of hide some of the inputs and some of the outputs. Yeah, and that's, this is where we get our, 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 our privacy properties, right? Because we can start to hide things. So, or we can hide everything, but that doesn't really make much sense. That, that kind of makes sense, but not in, not in a lot of applications. Uh, Okay, so, so for the rest of the talk, we'll just talk about this code, yeah? So in the center box inside the snark, we have this code that defines what we're verifying. Um, so we'll use that to verify that. Yeah, so, so that's the central problem that we're, we're trying to solve. Yeah, that it's difficult to, to, to make this code that, that verifies that, yeah. So it's difficult to define the computation that you're verifying you did correctly. So, so that's what we're going to talk about later, or that's like that's like the main theme of this talk. Yeah, that we'll go through that and we'll see how it applies to three different s solutions. Okay. Oh no, that's the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. So, how does this relate to Ethereum? So, so we can validate snacks inside the EVM. Uh, although it's a little bit expensive, it costs about 500,000 gas at Optimal to, to do that right now. But there's there there is scope to reduce those costs. Um, so, and this means we can have privacy and scalability. Yeah, we can have privacy by just hiding the inputs that we have, and we can add scalability because the, 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 valid, the verification of a proof is succinct. It takes the same amount of time no matter how complicated the, 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 the code that you are verifying is, yeah? So for the rest of the talk, we're gonna define the, the code that we saw in the previous figure here, yeah? We're just gonna define the code that defines the snack, okay? So, a lot of the time in blockchain we talk about a lot of the time in blockchain, we talk about Merkle trees, right? Because Merkle trees are a good aggregator of information. So this is how a Merkle tree works. Um, so basically, you have A, B, C, and D, and those are the members of our group, and we want to aggregate those together to a single a root, yeah? So what we do is we hash A and B together, we hash C and D together, and then we hash A and B, C and D together, and that gives us the root, yeah? So, so sorry, so we hash the hash of A and B and the hash of C and D together, and we get the root. Uh, so... 
And then we can make something called a Merkle proof and prove that we're a member, of, and we can prove that we're a member of that set. Okay, but so let's go forward. Okay, so let's let's think about this now. So so we can move, we can move the the that a Merkle proof inside a snark. Yeah, and this lets us do some really cool things. Okay, this lets us move. Yeah. Okay, so but but in order in order to so so we can do cool things here, but but it's it, it, there's nobody has any permissions here, right? Because A, B, C, and D are all public, and that means anyone can prove that A, B, and C, and D, A, B, C, or D are a member of our group, but that doesn't really that doesn't really help us. We wanna we wanna have a way that that people have some private information and they can use that private information to signal about, to to to. To, we want to we want to limit what people are able to do inside our system. So the way that we do that is this: that we come up with this really kind of naive, uh, we come up with this really naive kind of public key private key scheme. Yeah, and the public key is defined as the hash of of uh, of two inputs: one called the nullifier, and one called the secret. And the nullifier and the secret are just random numbers. We just regenerate these random numbers, and 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 we hash them together to create our public key, and we, and we give our public, and then we do something else with the public key. So anyone who knows the private key of the public key is able to make a signature, um, but this is a little bit naive, because if, if people are able to make the signatures, then they can always, then as soon as you make a signature, someone else can copy your signature, because when you make the signature, you reveal your private key. So it doesn't really work. Uh, but what we can do is we can put this inside the snark, yes? And if we put it inside the snark, we can hide the nullifier in the secret, and that means that our signature scheme becomes kind of, uh, yeah, that our signature scheme now makes sense. Okay, people can make signatures, and it doesn't reveal what their private key, so we can do this repeatedly. Yeah. Okay. So, but but now this doesn't really make sense, as I said before, right? Because we have we just people can prove that they're a member of this group, the Merkle the, the, that's defined by the root. People can people can prove that they're a member. But that doesn't really make sense because we don't reveal anything. And if you give that proof to somebody else, they don't even know what, you're, what, it, what it's talking about. I mean, they just know that you, they just know that you're a member of some Merkle root, and that doesn't that doesn't really make sense. So what so what we need to do is reveal the Merkle root, yeah. And now it starts to make sense, yeah. That now the the Merkle root is public to the verifier, and when they verify it, they can see that oh, this person must know the private key of a member of this of this group, okay. Oh wait. Where does it say the time? Is there some way for me to know the time? Okay, I can I can see. Okay, cool. Okay, so so now we can use it. Okay, so this is already enough to do some cool things. Okay, this is already enough to, to do um, to make a mixer. Okay, so the, this is what the mix and mismatch contract does. First of all, a user deposit an either into the contract, and I, I, and then the contract will allow them to add a leaf to to to, to our group. Yeah. Then a user can use a snark to prove that they know the secret information of a leaf in our, in our group. And users who prove this can withdraw a coin. And, this, this work, and because the only thing that we reveal in the previous, because the only thing we reveal is the Merkle root, there's no way for anyone to know which leaf led to which withdrawal. But there's a problem with this. Um, so does anybody know what the problem is? Yes? Sorry? Okay, that, yeah, that's also a problem, but that's not the one. <laughs> that's not the one that I contrived to, to talk about next. Um, so, so yeah, that's definitely a problem. But the way that we solve that is that we limit it to to one ether per deposit and one ether per withdrawal. And yeah, so it is a problem, and there is ways to think and fix that, and, and we can talk about those in a while. Uh, but has anyone another a problem? Yes. Yes, exactly. You can do a double spend, right? Because nobody, because you just prove you're part of the Merkle root. Yeah, and people can people can just take out coins again and again. As long as you're a single member, you can repeatedly take money out because there's no there's no sort of there's nothing to prevent you from from double spending. Yeah, it's a double spend problem because you just don't have information about about who was withdrawn previously. So, okay, how do we fix this problem? Does anyone have any ideas? Output balance. Yes, publish notifier. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I said uh, add balance to the output. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that would that would kind of work, but if people because everyone uses the same balance, it doesn't really it doesn't. I could just deposit the same balance to somebody else, and just take. I could take all. Let's say one ether is a, a popular amount. I could just take one ethers out a bunch of times, 
But yeah, publish the nullifier, exactly. So, so we kind of contrived to have this nullifier here previously as part of the public key, and that's why I didn't just call it private key. So, so what we do is we, we publish the nullifier. Yeah, we make that public. And then in our smart contract, we, 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 we remember that whenever someone uses a certain nullifier, we remember it, and then we prevent people from withdrawing with the same nullifier twice. Um, so this actually introduces another problem that we need to think about, but it's kind of outside the scope of the talk. But, but the problem is that, that there's a, like a griefing attack here, that someone could, someone could see that I'm trying to withdraw a nullifier x, and quickly deposit, deposit nullifier x again, and then withdraw that, and then my withdrawal would fail. But this is a griefing attack, and it's like $1 for $1. I mean, it's very expensive to, to hurt people with it. But yeah, it's definitely a problem. Um, but, but yeah, there's ways to fix it, but it's kind of outside the scope of what, of what we want to talk about. OK, so now we can check. Yeah, so now every time we withdraw, we make sure that that coin hasn't been withdrawn already. OK, so that's how Mixamus works. I mean, that's, 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 that's exactly what we have currently in the GitHub. Um, OK, so we have some problems with that. Uh, and I, I, one of the major problems is, is who, who, who pays for the gas, right? So the, the thinking is that if I deposit one Ether, and then later I deposit another Ether, I need to have gas in that account in order to pay for the transaction fee of the withdrawal. And because I can't do that, yeah, because now you have a chicken and the egg situation. It's like, I have this anonymous money, but I need non-anonymous money to take it out. So that becomes a problem. Um, so, so there's a way to solve that. I don't know if I talk about that in the next slide or not. No, so the way, the way that we saw that is we do like layer two transaction abstraction, which is, oh, it's actually called meta transactions. That's the new name for it. Um, so what we do is a meta transaction where, where people get a fee for, for broadcasting these proofs. And the fee is like a portion of the amount of money that you deposited. Um, okay, so then uh, problem number two is that people can analyze the inputs and the outputs uh, to track the users, yeah? And I, so this is more like a temporal attack, and you can use these heuristics to let's say that let's say that I deposit one ether into the smart contract, and then I withdraw that one ether in the next block. I mean, it's very obvious that it, it's kind of obvious who 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 deposited. Yeah, I, I mean, you can't connect them cryptographically, but you can come up with these sort of clever heuristics about about how how much you can how much you can take in and take out. And and that's part of the reason why I, I prevented the having multiple amounts because. Because if you have multiple amounts, the amount that you withdraw is also an indicator of who deposited. Yeah, that let's say that I deposited 1.1567 ether, and then someone later withdrew 1.567 ether. It's a good bet that it was me who it was my withdrawal. I mean, what we want to do is maximize our privacy set. So, yeah. So that, that's those are some thoughts on that. So we we have a proposal for the layer two transaction abstraction, and, and hopefully we'll be able to sort of merge it with with someone else's. Um, but anyway, that, that's kind of current future work that needs to be done. Uh, okay. So can we allow multiple deposit sizes? And that's kind of that's kind of what I already addressed. And, and yeah, it's it's also trivial to 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 allow ERC twenty token deposits and withdrawals. Um, but we need to be careful about the privacy set again. Um, if these tokens have sort of low volume, then it's unlikely that people will be able to. If these if these if these transactions have low volume, then it'll be unlikely that people. Yeah, I mean, people might think that this is really super private, and and it might not be. I mean, it's just something to be aware of when when when, when we're thinking about these things, because yeah, okay. And then there's like other kind of further research questions about how can we can we increase the size of our privacy set by being able to trade from one currency to another privately, and that would that would be kind of cool. I mean, that would that would sort of merge our separated ERC twenty tokens into a way that that we could into something that makes it a little bit that has stronger anonymity properties. But that that seems that seems to be a, a difficult a difficult thing to do. Um, but we, we can see that that sort of future future work. Okay, so, so basically, so that's the end of Miximus. Okay, so, so that's, that's, that's all I really have to say about Miximus for now. So it's a general token mixer that, that you can use to, 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 to mix your Ether or your tokens. So this is, this, is, this, is, this is like, cool, it's nice work, but it's a little bit, it's, it's not really very, uh, um, it's, it's, it's very similar to Zcash's work, and I mean, it's similar to things that already exist. I mean, they don't exist in Ethereum, but it's like work that's been done before, and it's cool. But I would sort of search for other ways to use Snacks to do other things. So the thing that I'm actually more interested in is, is something called Semaphore, which is, which is very, very similar to, to, to Miximus. So, so instead, of, instead of depositing one Ether and being allowed to join the tree, 
we come up with some other rule that lets people join the tree. Yeah, we could have like a, a sign in with GitHub button. And people who sign in with GitHub are able to, are able to join this Merkle tree and, and then they can make proofs about things. Yeah, and if they don't sign in, with, and, and we sort of limit the amount of members in the group, so this, this tree becomes like a proof of GitHub. Yeah, and anyone with GitHub is able, to, is able to, to make signals about things. So how do we do this? How do we make like a generic signaling application? And the way that we do it is, so, so basically we have a lot of what we need already. Yeah, it's very similar to Mixamus. We have the same public key, the same private key. I should do the air quotes when I say public key, private key. Uh, we have the same setup, and then we have a Merkle tree where we aggregate all of these together. And then we put that inside a snark, um, and we add. You see here, you see here in the inputs, we've we've added the the ID of a signal. So the signal is just like 32 bytes, and it says it's the hash of something that you want to say. I mean, it could be the hash of a tweet, or it could be the hash of of, of a vote, or it could be a hash of something else. Um, yeah. So we include that. Yeah. So yeah. So we include the signal, but we still have another problem. And what is the problem? Does anybody know? Yeah? Anybody know? So think, think about the difference between what we do with Max, Miximus. Like Miximus is, we only want to use Miximus one time. But this we want to use multiple times. Does anyone have any ideas? So the problem is, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can't just you know, use your nullifier because you should be able to use it again. Exactly. Yeah. So the answer is that you 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 if you reuse you you we force you to reuse the same nullifier here, and when we force you to do that, you can link different signals together. Yeah. So if I say if I do one tweet and one vote, the nullifier will be the same. And I will, I will be able to link those two things together. And it still has like, it's still anonymous-ish, but because you can connect them together, it's, it's not really great. Because, I mean, because we don't really want to do that. I mean, we want to be able to tweet and vote and do a bunch of other things and have them disconnected from each other. Ah, yeah, so the nullifier has yeah, links of signals. So how, how can we fix this? Does anyone have any ideas? Sorry? Hash it with a counter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we, add, so we add this idea of an external nullifier. Yeah, so we hash the nullifier with the external nullifier inside the snark. And I, I mean, this gets a little bit, a little bit messy. But, but yeah, that, that works. So we have this external nullifier. And, and we hash the two together. So now our, 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 extern, our, our, um, our new nullifier are, will be unique. Because as long as the external nullifier is different, then each signal is unique. And we can limit people from making multiple signals about the same thing, but we can't connect the same, uh, two different signals about two different topics together. Okay. Okay, so now I have two examples. Let me see what time it is. Okay, so this is, uh, this is looking good. So we can, we can talk about the, at least this example and maybe another. So, so like, this, is, this, is, this starts to get a little bit complicated, so let's do an example to, to, make, it, to make it a little bit clearer. So, so let's do first past the post voting, yeah, and let's just think about that. So first past the post voting is just where everybody votes, and then you count the votes, and whoever has the most votes at the end of the count wins. Um, maybe that's not exactly what, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm talking about anyway. I'm not sure if that's the technical definition of first past the post voting, but yeah. Okay, so, so let's say that everyone in this room comes up and we vote for, some decision, yeah, it, whether, whether zero or one, wh whether, whether people thought DEFCON was good or people thought DEFCON was bad, good. Okay, so we have this binary decision and we, and we come up with some framework. So we say that, okay, we all agree on, on the same signal, yeah? And the signal is, oh, wait. Yeah, so we all, we all agree on the same signal and the signal is that DevCon is bad. And we have another signal, and that signal is DevCon is good. Yeah? And people can vote, and we'll count up all of them together, and at the end, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll see who thought, how many people thought DevCon was good, and how many people thought DevCon was bad. 
Uh, and then finally, we need to think about our external nullifier. So who thinks that we should use the same external nullifier for, for, for both signals? OK, and who thinks we shouldn't use the same external nullifier for both signals? OK. OK, so if we don't use the same external nullifier for both signals, then, then people would be able to vote, I think DEFCON was good, and I think DEFCON was bad, and we'll have no way to detect them. So we need to, we need to have the same nullifier, external nullifier for both. OK? And this way, you can, you, you can link the votes together, which kind of sucks. But you also limit people from voting twice, which is definitely a good idea. Uh, OK. So now we can, let's talk about something a little bit more uh, complicated. So we can also do like proportional representation. Uh, and proportional representation is another form of voting where, where instead of voting, like having a binary choice, you can, you can choose among multiple, multiple different choices. So the idea, so let's, let's expand our, our previous example where we had, oh, I think Devon was good, I think Devon was bad, and now we can add a third one and, I, and say that I think Devon was okay, but I think, I think we can do better next year. Uh, so that people can, people can choose. Oh, actually, that doesn't really make sense. I think, it, I think, it, I think it makes more sense for like leadership elections. So let's say that we vote between an elephant, a giraffe, and a kangaroo to be our, to be our leaders, okay? And we want, so, so, okay, so different people like different animals more, yeah? Oh, let's change one of them to a lion. So an elephant, a kangaroo, and a lion. Yeah, because this, this makes more sense, okay? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so okay, so we're voting between an elephant, kangaroo, and a lion, right? And we want to pick, yeah, so some people really, some people really don't want to vote for the lion. So oh, well, wait, I'm explaining the, the benefits of proportional representation. And I shouldn't do that, because I don't really, it's not really on topic. OK. OK, so um, OK, so yeah, so, so basically, we can do the same thing. But for the elephant, the lion, and the kangaroo, they each have a different signal. But the external nullifier always stays the same. OK? Yeah. So that, that, that really makes sense. And it's very similar to the previous example. So maybe I should. OK. OK, so let's just keep going. I mean, here is the current problems with, 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 with semaphore. Um, so can, we, so can we build a proportional representation where you can't link the votes together? Because I mean, in the previous example, it's clear that we have to use the same external nullifier uh, for each signal, and that kind of lets us, lets us link that, oh, I voted first for the kangaroo, and then for the giraffe, and then for the lion. And, that's, that, and that will reveal information about the electorate in general, and maybe we want to stop doing it. Maybe we, want, we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so, so that's one thing, uh, but that's really complicated. Uh, and can we do quadratic voting like this? Uh, that's another interesting question. There's like a bunch of applications for semaphore that, that haven't really been explored. Um, again, how do we pay the gas? That is, if you do this, if you do this on chain. But I don't. We I haven't. I've done a little bit of on chain stuff with this. But in general, it makes more sense to have, to have it as an off chain off chain scalability solution. Oh no, off chain signaling solution. I mean, it just works a lot better because you have to pay 500,000 gas for every vote, which is which doesn't really work very well. Um, okay, and then can we make deniable signatures? So this is this is more to do with like uh, anti-coercion voting. Oh no, bribery resistant voting or coercion resistant voting, where where someone can force someone to either through physical force or through money to, or they can pay them to vote a certain way. And this is a bad thing, and we all agree it's a bad thing, and we should think about how to solve it. Uh, and there's and there's some ways that we can do it, but they're kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, but if anyone's interested to talk about that, we can talk about it later. Uh, okay, so now, now some more limitations of the snark work that we've done so far. So the proving time is uh, is, is quite long for for Mixamus and Semaphore. Um, it takes about I have some numbers here. Oh wait, no, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so then there's okay, so this is so so now we've talked about Mixamus and we've talked about Semaphore, and we see that this, we see that it, that we have some cool some cool things that we can do with these. So there's a bunch and there's a bunch of like open opportunities to continue this work and to do other cool stuff with it. For example, we could have a yeah. So example, we could have we could we could build this kind of group. I mean, we don't really have any groups in Semaphore yet, and it would be nice to have a group of people who could signal about something together. 
Um, and then we can expand this. So, so one way to do that is to have a, like, a, we have to have a way to limit the amount of people who can join a group. Otherwise, you can just join the group and, and signal about whatever you want. Yeah, or do sock puppet attacks and things like that, which we know, sock puppet, puppet attack is where, is where, like, you see this really interesting discourse on some social media platform, but it turns out it's just one person with many accounts talking to themselves. And it's a way to sort of propagate your ideas and, uh, and force the discourse on a topic in a certain direction. And um, in general, I think this is bad, and oh no, I, this is bad, and we should we should find a way to stop it. Um, so one way, to, so the way to stop it is to limit the amount of people who can join the conversation. But we also want everyone to be able to join the conversation. We just don't. We just want everyone to be able to join once. So there's a bunch of ways to think about how we limit people from joining them. And one of the and one of the ways is, it, uh, although it's really it's really it's not very strong. It's very weak. Is to have like a GitHub based uh, Merkle tree joining. And we have some other, and then there's some other ways to do it, and I can talk about those later. Um, okay, so then the next, the next idea is to is to build on top of some sort of uh, membership requirement to build on top of that and to make some sort of social media platform. So this so this would be a little bit different than the the ones that we're used to. That instead of having like a person who tweets about something, we could have a instead of having a person who tweets about something, we could have a group. Yeah, you would join a group, and your group would engage in discourse internally and externally. So you could see a group of people discussing something, and some of the people believe something, and other people believe something else. And I think that if we remove like the idea of the self from this, uh, I think if we remove the idea of the self from this, then we can... Uh, I think it will lead to like more open discourse. So, so this is like a, sort of a philosophical tangent that I'm going to go on, but this is this is what I this is this is my sort of reasoning for this. Is that like, in general, in life, it's it, normally it's easy for people to coordinate inside a group. It's easy for people to say, "Oh, listen, I think this, and I think this," and people have this sort of healthy discourse, and then they agree or disagree, and this is this is very good for everybody. But other, but sometimes this is not possible. Sometimes, like um, for an example. Sometimes a minority inside a group can be oppressed by the majority, and the majority can impose some sort of costs on the minority when they try to coordinate. And it comes, and, and this will lead to a point where, where the minority are unable to sort of uh, even admit that they're part of the minority because they're afraid of oppression or something like that, or they're afraid of some sort of consequence for this for this admission. And there's been a bunch of rights movements that have been uh, that have centered around people saying that, oh, I'm part of this group and and revealing that and paying this kind of high social cost. But that's like not very good for everybody. I mean, there should be a way for people to coordinate without having to pay this high cost. And one of the ways for people to coordinate and not pay this high cost is to make these like anonymous signaling groups. Yeah, and people can, say, can, can anonymously say, oh, I'm part of this group without revealing which, part of the, which member of the group they are. So they, 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 they can't be... They can't be the victim of some kind of oppression because they... they or it's more difficult for them to be a victim of some kind of oppression. Uh, and they're also free to sort of express disbelief. And this, I think, is a healthy thing for society in general because people should be free to sort of coordinate with each other and express their beliefs. And I think that when, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's like the end of the philosophical tangent, but that's, 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 uh, that's why we need to have these sort of anonymity system or systems with strong anonymity properties. So I'm very interested in people, are, in people who are interested in working on this, in building things with Semaphore, and please talk to me afterwards if you are. There's a bunch of, there's a few people working on this and we're happy for other people to join and there's a lot of open opportunities. Um, so, so then, so then we can have anonymous credential systems, and this is where you can just sign into something without revealing who you are, and we can, and that's a whole other use case that we can have. Uh, then we can have reputation systems, and it's, in fact, we, I found a way to build a reputation system where where you can uh, kind of exclude someone from the group if they if they uh, if they if they break some rules. So let's say that I have like a VPN server, and I'm like I, I let everybody use my VPN server. Who's in this? Who's in this room? I, at the end of the thing, I just go around and I collect everyone's private key, and I say, okay, everyone's allowed to join. But then uh, some someone starts to use this VPN all the time, and they use too much of the bandwidth, and I have to remove them from the system. So this this kind of talks this post here talks about how we can do that, 
and what we can do. Yeah, so this this post, this ease research post, talks about how we can do that and and other things about that. And yeah, so it's sort of the limits and trade offs and whether this is useful or not. Uh, no, this is definitely useful. So this is this is another kind of direction that we can go in with Semaphore. Okay, so there's a bunch more stuff we can build with Semaphore, and I kind of think that like um, not enough people are working on this. So I'm happy to sort of talk with people afterwards or during the question and answer session about this. And, uh, yeah, and hopefully we can sort of do some work together. Okay. Okay, so then also I want to promote this Ethnarx. So Ethnarx is, is, is this uh, Ethereum Snark project that's is, uh, fun, funded by the Ethereum Foundation that are, are moving forward with some of the, the lower level uh, cryptographic primitives that we need. And they're doing a bunch of good stuff. And if anyone has some C++ experience or wants to learn a little bit about Snark, that this will be a good place to sort of contribute. There's also Zocrates and Circom. I, I I think I have Circum later, um, but um, sorry, Socrates. Um, it's also a cool project. I, I maybe had them later. Um, so uh, so we also use uh, ERC twenty tokens. Oh yeah. So this is other things we can fix with Miximus. So we could uh, make a pull request to include ERC twenty tokens. Uh, Etsnax have 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 reimplemented it in a much more efficient way, and it'd be nice to sort of port their work to the original repository. Uh, yeah, and then it would be good to merge Mixmus and 7.4 together because they're so similar. It would just be good to have a single, a single uh, repository. Um, okay, and then then there's other work to do. We can replace the hash function, which I'll talk about in a while. And then there's also a bunch more 7.4 use cases that 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 would be nice to explore and talk about. Okay, so let's talk about some of some of the figures of of what we have. So so. <sighs> Okay, so so the hash function. So we need in order to make a Merkle tree. In order to make a Merkle tree, we need to have a hash function, and the hash function that we use right now is SHA-256, and SHA-256 is very expensive to do inside a inside a snark because it's based upon binary operations, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so the proving time in 7.4 is about seven minutes, and the, the Merkle tree, the depth of the Merkle tree is 29, which means there's like 29 hashes. Uh, so that's yeah, so it's quite expensive. But that it, the tree is very big. It's enough for like 500 million people to join. Um, so on my laptop, it takes about seven minutes, and it needs a lot of RAM. It's impossible to run it on a smartphone, and this is a problem. Uh, so it's about 50k cons uh, constraints per hash, which is which is which leads to 1.5 million constraints altogether. And this makes the pro this is the reason why the proving time is so slow. So we want to minimize the we want to minimize the proving time. So we want to make it, so we want to reduce the number of constraints. So let's talk about how we can do this. Okay, so inside the snark, we can do a time. We can we can do this. We can sort of check these assertions, yeah. And we can check two side kinds, side kinds of assertions. We can say that a multiplied by b equals c, and we can say, check that we can check multiplications and additions. So we can also replace a and b with a bunch of additions of, of something else, yeah, where it can be the sums, sums of things. Yeah, so then we can already do cool things with this. I mean, we can already implement every compu any computation with this, right? Because we, and the, and the way that we, the way that we end, up, end up doing it is, okay, for example, can, can, can anyone think about how to, de how to design an XOR gate with this? I mean, maybe this is probably not a good interactive question, but this is a good sort of learning experience to make an XOR gate at the start and, and just see how you can make these constraints. Also, I have a list of these problems that, that, that are kind of interesting to approach at the start. So if anyone's interested in that, please let me know. Um, yeah, so SHA-256 is binary oper it has a bunch of binary op operations. One of them is an XOR, and then there's like sigma shifting stuff and a whole other bunch of stuff. So what we do is, or what other people have done, what the Libsnark people have done, is they've implemented SHA-256. They've implemented it in, in Libsnark, and, and they've just built all the basic gadgets and plugged them all together. So we can, we can, we can already do this, but it, it turns out it's, it's really expensive. Um, to, because we just turn everything into binary, and inside the binary we use, we, we can just do zero and one, where we have, we can actually do a lot more expressive things inside the snark. Uh, so how, how, can we can, how can we improve this? So let's talk about what we can do inside the snark. So we can do this a times, a times b equals c, where a and b and c are all these are sums. Um, and we can also, but we have to be careful because we have to, we have an overflow. So snarks work over this prime field, and if we get to this number, which is about 253 bits, which is 253 bits, we, we will overflow, and we, if we add one more, we'll overflow. Uh, so we wrap around at this other number down here, which is about 2, two to 253 bits. 
So it turns so that means that we do all our arithmetic modulo p, yeah, where p is where p is a prime number. So does, does anyone know how this can be? How we can use this? Anyone have any ideas how we can use this to build like an interesting, interesting things? This is a, this is a difficult question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it turns it turns out that we can use this to build elliptic curves. Yeah, because okay, so if we take a, if we take example of sec uh, sec p two fifty six k one, which is about where p is two to the two fifty six bits, uh, all operations are carried uh, modulo p. So it turns out that we could we could build a, a comparative elliptic curve inside the snark and do uh, and have all our arithmetic modulo p done for free. So so we just do regular multiplications and additions inside the snark, and it would turn out that that would be that those those operations were done modulo p. So. So why don't we do this with sec p 256k1? The reason that we don't do it with, with, with this curve is because they have edge cases at the, uh, when, you, when you try and double points. OK, so if, if, if people are, are like struggling to follow, that's OK. I mean, this is, this, is, this is kind of a little bit difficult stuff. And it's going to get easier in a little bit. It's just, I'm just talking about how to build these crypto, cryptographic primitives for like two more minutes. And then we're going to get back to the regular kind of, OK, now we put this here, and now we put this here. And, how do we build things with this? Okay, okay. So, so the reason why we don't use the reason why we pick, so we use a twisted Edwards curve. Yeah, we use a twisted Edwards curve. Then these are the formulas and these are point additions. We use a twisted Edwards curve because it doesn't have edge cases when you when you uh, double the identity or you yeah when you double the identity or you add the identity to something else. So in general, in science, we don't want to have edge. If, if we had an edge case, we'd have to have. If, if we had an edge case, we'd have to have an if loop. And if we have an if loop, that's, that's not very good inside a snark. It's just really expensive to do an if loop. Because we have to do everything a times b equals c, which, which is really, OK, there's another example. How do you make an if loop with a times b equals c? It's totally possible, but it's, it turns out that it's, it's prohibitively expensive when you do it a bunch of times. OK, so this is the curve. Doo -doo -doo. These are the point multiply. Uh, yeah, so then. So then, OK, so inside the curve, we need to, so we need to be able to do two things to do elliptic curve cryptography. cryptography. Uh, the first thing is to do point additions, which is easy. We can use these formulas here. Uh, and we can implement, implement those inside the snark easily. Uh, the second is to do uh, point addition, uh, point multiplica scalar multiplication. And we can do that too. It's just a little bit more complicated. Uh, and we just do a, a bunch of double and add. Uh, actually, scalar multiplication just degrades to, to just additions. Well, yeah, we can figure that out too. And you, yeah. We can figure that out too, and we can use windowed exponentiation. Uh, we could switch to windowed exponentiation, which will save us a lot of constraints. And uh, Ed Snacks have done that already. They're, they're now becoming the canonical implementation. Although Circum have a competing one, and Zocrates are, are going to make their own implementation soon. So we're going to have a bunch of these implementations that people can use to, to, to do elliptic curve stuff. Uh, I hope it's OK that I said that. Um, OK, it's good. OK. Uh, but, <laughs> um, OK, so then these are some links that will teach you about elliptic curve operations and how to do that, and just the general background. Yeah, because this is, this is, I mean, the last couple of slides were generally difficult stuff, and it's OK that you, if you didn't understand them. Um, and now we're going to get back to the, uh, oh yeah, so I just have some future work about this. So, and then we're going to get back to the regular stuff. So, oh, I'm not sure that link is right. Uh, but you, you guys, you, you, you folks can find it. Uh, Okay, so so future work. So the first thing is that this 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 work should be treated. Uh, yeah, this work hasn't been reviewed, and I don't think that anybody should use this in production until it's been reviewed a lot. Uh, this is like the rule in crypto is don't or the rule in cryptocurrencies is don't roll your own crypto, uh, and I did, and this is this is what. <laughs> um, OK, so, so please be very careful about this. Also, if you have crypto cryptography expertise, it would be, I'd be very interested to talk to you about sort of re reviewing some of this work and, um, so more people can use it. But uh, at least we should say that it's possible to do this kind of uh, cryptographic stuff inside a snark. Uh, this is, yeah, this is at least an example of how that's possible. Um, so it's for Peterson hashes and a signature scheme, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah, so, okay, so it would be good to get some review, and here's where you can review it. Uh, and then there's a possibility that it, we could build bulletproofs in the same way and embed them inside the snack, and that's a nice, interesting, that's an interesting, like, uh, research problem. 
And then there is also, it would be cool if we could do like recursive snacks, or at least recurse one layer. And then we can do something like the ZSC paper. There was this paper recently about using recursive snacks to do like private smart contracts. Um, so that, that's an also an interesting uh, sort of future, future direction. Uh, okay. Okay, and also I want to say thanks to, to Daria Hopwood and, and, uh, for, for, for help and advice about this, as well as the Zcash team, who have, done, who, I, 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 who have done very similar work before me and really lit the way for me when I was doing this. Um, it's specifically this issue, you can see, it's so cool. They just they describe everything, every single step of their decision making. And then there's, they also have a blog post about, about, how, about how to do it. So very, very thankful to them. Uh, and, and actually, they're using it now in the wild. Uh, so they just had a hard fork a couple of days ago, and now they're, they're using Patterson commitments. Uh, oh, yeah, so wait, I should have talked about that. Oh, sorry. OK, so, so what can we actually use this to do? Like, what is, the, what is a elliptic curve inside a snack useful for? And the answer is, as you said, uh, Pedersen, or as you asked, Pedersen commitments and, and signature scheme. So on top of this, on top of this, we've built a, I, I built a Pedersen commitments and signature scheme, and Etsnax have also implemented it. Um, so and Zcash are now using this in the wild. They've had it audited, although their work is is a little bit different than ours because they use a different, they use a different uh, curve, and that means that their yeah, so their their work is not directly trans transferable, but it's still like a proof of concept that this is possible. Okay, so a big thanks to them and congratulations to them on their recent hard fork. It's cool. Okay, so next we're going to talk about we're going to talk about scalability. So how much time? Twenty minutes. Cool. Okay, so next we're going to talk about scalability. So so far we've done. So far. Yeah, so so far we've just talked about using using snacks for privacy, and now we're going to talk about using snacks for scalability. So we can. So so the thing that we were missing was a signature scheme. Before before that, we we weren't able to really use it for for privacy, but now we can, or for scalability, but now we can. Uh, so here's here's what we do. We take the we take we we make this new form, as opposed to before, where we had we just had the private key be just this simple two images that or two to this just secret key that we hashed together we got the, the public uh, the public key we replace this now with with this new construction and this is for this is for a generic database yeah a permission database so in the tree we have a b and c and each a b and c has a public key associated with it as well as an object so the public key tells says uh, says who is allowed to update this object yeah, and the object can be whatever you want it to be. It can be like a list of tweets, it can be your token balance, it can be a bunch of other things as well. So this is like a generic uh, scalability solution where you can update these leaves in the Merkle tree in batches. So I think I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Yeah, okay, so the way that this works is that we have a single prover, yeah, and we have a bunch of users. And what the users do is they aggregate signatures together. And no, what the users do is they make signatures and they pass it to the prover. And the prover aggregates these signatures together and, use, and makes a ZK snack to prove that they updated the Merkle tree correctly. So let's see how that looks. Oh, I should have. Yeah, so this is what they do. They have the old Merkle root. Then they have a snark where they prove that everything was done correctly. That they, they, where they validate a bunch of signatures, and then they have the new Merkle root. Yeah, and, and this proof is, is proof that they have possession of these. That, that's, so, so, they, so for example, they can't update the tree. They can't update and take someone's money unless they have a signature to send it somewhere. So what the user does if they want to send, if they want to update the leaf, is that they sign A, E, E, and B. Yeah? And then our snack does the following things. Okay? The snack checks that the signature matches the public key, pub key here, in B. Oh, yeah. Yeah, checks that the signature matches pub key. Uh, generates the, the leaf B by hashing it with the object that, that's, that's, that the, the user probably also provided. Uh, checks that that leaf is in the, in the tree. And then replaces that leaf B with the new leaf E. OK? So you see what happens. You see what happens. You can go like this. Yeah? 
Okay, and what we do is we have a snark that, that, that proves that before we had, we had root and now we have updated root. So, the, so we use a smart contract to verify each transition. And now the operator, now, now, we, now we know that we have a smart contract that validates each transition. And now, and now we have a system where the, where, sorry. Now, now, yeah. So this is just a, a general scalability system. So we know. So now the operator isn't able to isn't able to update the tree unless the users allow them to. Unless the user gives them a signature and says, "Okay, update my leaf A to B, A to E." Yeah. So that makes that makes sense. I mean, but this is this this really doesn't work as it is, right? Because this really doesn't work as it is because it costs five hundred thousand gas to validate the snark, right? And it costs like less than less than ten thousand gas to validate a signature inside the snark, inside the EVM. So why, why would we use this? Does anyone have any ideas? OK, so, so batch. Yes, batch them up. Because the verification of a snark is succinct, we can include as many as we want inside the snark. Yeah? So basically, instead of, instead of using this for one single transaction, we use this for like 10,000 transactions. Yeah, so we can aggregate together 10,000 transactions, and we, can, and we can use this to update the Merkle root. So this is where we get our scalability benefit. Yeah, so now it takes 500,000 gas to validate 10,000 transactions, which is great. I mean, it's great. We're moving, things are getting cheaper. Okay, so, so now, so just to summarize, to link the cryptographic so, to cryptography stuff to here. So what we did before when we defined this uh, Twisted Edwards curve that we were using is that we, we wanted to make a signature scheme. And we needed to make a signature scheme so the users could sign something and the, and, and, and the, oper and the prover wasn't able to, to sort of steal people's money and move things around. So we made this signature scheme and now we just validate a bunch of signature schemes inside the snark and we update our root. Yeah, old root, new root. Perfect, so we, do that, so we do that a bunch of times inside the snark, we have like a for loop and we end up with just a single proof that we had transition A to B correctly. New root to, to new root correctly. Okay, so what are some problems with this? Okay, so some problems with this is, is the proving time. So the proving time is quite, quite high. I think you can prove on, 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 on like regular hardware uh, to, to 20 million constraints. Um, and that's about enough for maybe 12, 12 transactions. But, but it, that's not our limiting factor here. So because it turns out that we can use AWS Amazon Web Services to do to batch these or another cluster, yeah, just any cluster to batch these transactions together, and to make the proofs. But this costs money, but it doesn't cost a lot of money. It costs like uh, one thousand two hundred dollars per proof, which is totally which is totally fine if you if you're doing one thousand two hundred dollars for ten thousand transactions, it works out really cheap. Um, Yeah, okay, so um, we can use Pedersen commitments. Uh, it's difficult to have a hash function that's efficient inside the snark, inside the EVM, but that, I should talk about that in a while. Uh, okay, so now our only problem becomes this. Our only problem is now the data availability problem. Yeah, that, that we know that the operator can't steal people's money, but, we, but the operator is able, to, is able to block people from getting their money. And does anybody know how they do this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they refuse to publish it. Yeah, they refuse to put, so, so someone does a Merkle tree update, yeah? And then they refuse to update, publish to people the Merkle leaves that they need to make the proof, yeah? And when you refuse to do that, nobody is able to move their money anymore. So now let's talk about sort of solutions to this. Oh, I'm almost done, this is the last time. Okay, so, so one, of, one of the ideas is, is, is this thing called rollup and rollback. Yeah, so with rollup, what you do is the, the prover continues to update the Merkle tree, they, they do these transitions, and then, any, and then, and then we have this, we have what, we, what is called, uh, yeah, so it's similar, it's similar to plasma exits, and we, can mer we, we cannot merge and split leaves, it's just, like, it's just like plasma cache, I think, where you have like these independent leaves, and you can't join them together, but you can send them to other people. Uh, okay, so, that's, so one solution is roll-up, yeah, which I'll talk about in the next slide, and the other solution is to, is to pass all the data from the EVM into the stack. Yeah, and Vitalik has a nice post about this, and I'll talk about this in a, uh, a little bit as well. So, so how does rollup rollback work? And rollup, oh no, rollup rollback is actually called Snazma. Rollup rollback is the old name. So, so we have a priority queue, 
Okay, so so listen, we have so the operator aggregates everyone's transactions and they and they go block at a time, block at a time, uh, moving forward with the chain. And then at some point in the future, let's imagine that our operator becomes malicious and they refuse to publish the the the, the Merkle path or the Merkle leaves that you need in order to exit your coins. So what do we do? So we have this thing called a priority queue, a priority exit queue. And basically, anyone who enters the priority exit queue is able to, is, is uh, anyone who enters that queue, the operator must serve that queue within the timeout that we define, like a week, two weeks, something like that. And if the operator doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fulfill that request, what we do is we slash the operator and we say that, okay, data is now unavailable. Yeah, and what we do is we start to, we do two things now. Yeah, and we start the rollback mechanism. So this is probably the next one. So rollback, okay, so here's, here's the current, here's, let me set the stage. So we have, the operator has been running for a while, for five states. Yeah, we started at S1 where the one person deposited one coin. Yeah, and we know that data is completely available then. Then we move, then we, we, we started to move forward. The operator makes snack proofs and validated them on chain and we ended up at state five. Yeah, and at state five, the operator refuses to share the data. So at state five, we enter the priority queue and the operator refuses to, refuses to exit us. So what we do is we stash the operator and we have this kind of auction for a new operator. Yeah, someone else to take over the chain. Um, the, when you bid in this auction, what you have to do is you say, you say the state that you want to begin from, you, the state that you want to take over from. So you don't have to continue from state five. You can continue from any previous state. So you say the state that you want to continue from, and you say, you say the state that you want to continue from, and you say how much you want to put as your deposit. Yeah, and we have like this idea of a limited deposit and something, uh, something like that. Uh, that's fine. So, so we finish the auction and we select the, the bidder who selected the newest state with the highest, uh, the highest bid. Yeah? And then what do we do? Let's say that the new operator yeah, so the idea is that the new operator will never, will never ask to continue from a state where they have all the data available to them, from a state where they don't have all the data available, because they will be trivially slashed immediately, yeah, and they'll lose all their, their whole deposit. So then let's say that the, uh, the new operator comes and they say, okay, I'm going to take over at state three. So what, we, what do we do? We have to transition from state five to state three. So what we do is we say that, okay, anyone who has a, an in-flight transaction between state, in state four or state five is able to exit, yeah? And we have another period where we have this kind of plasma style exit where people come forward and say, okay, I wanna go, I wanna leave, and that works out fine. Um, so, so then we roll back to state three and the new operator continues. Yeah. And if no, so if, if no operator comes forward and says, listen, I want to continue, we just go all the way back to state zero. And that's just basically a plasma exit. It's more ordered, though. Yeah. Where was I? This one. Yeah. Okay, so that kind of works, but it's, it's, it, 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 there's, there's a bunch of problems with that. And one of the major problems is that you can't split and join leaves together for a reason that I can discuss afterwards if people have questions about it. And another problem with that is... Another problem with that is like this idea of finality, that you, you, you don't know that, you, you're not guaranteed that your state is not gonna change and roll back. But we can have these kind of weaker finality assumptions and you can say that, listen, if I have all the data for a single, for a single state, I know, that, uh, if there's a, I know that someone will come forward to take over from another state, or I can come forward and take over from that state. So people will know that, okay, we only roll back a little bit. Um, okay, so that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of how roll up, roll back. SNASMA, that's how SNASMA works, okay. Okay, so now the other option is to do data availability inside the chain. And what we do is we just pass all the variables from the EVM to the snark, and we verify, we ver uh, and this way no one is able to, no one is able to, uh, we pass all of them, yeah, this way the, the data is definitely available. We rely on Ethereum's data availability guarantees. Yeah, but this, this is kind of, this is not great for two reasons, uh, for some reasons, it's, uh, it costs a lot of gas per transaction, which is sort of limits our scaling, not at the amount of proofs that we can make or the size of proofs that we can make, but at the, at the cost per transaction. So we were limited by gas inside the EVM because we have to pay gas every transaction that we include. Yeah, uh, yeah so I talk about compressing here, but I, I'll sort of leave out the nuance of that. But um, yeah, we have to compress the data too inside the EVM. But compressing is just hashed together. Um, so that works. That, that works too, and this is kind of the approach that we've sort of moving forward with at the moment. 
so this is a comparison with Plasma, which I already sort of did. OK, and then I have two examples. So this is like, I, I, let's finish. The, I won't do the examples because uh, we only have like five minutes, eight minutes left. Yeah, five, five or six minutes left. OK, so let's just talk about yeah, these two examples quickly. So one is you get Nifty, and this, this was done at a hackathon in Berlin by a bunch of people. Uh, and I would say their names, but I'm not sure they want me to say their names, so I won't. Unless they're, yeah. OK, so uh, yeah, so basically they did a non-fungible token uh, with rollup, um, and, and it works pretty well. And we also are, or me and a few people, are working on uh, making some sort of generic token with this, where we can just batch token transfers together. Uh, yeah, each, and if we were going to use data availability on chain, as I said before, and each uh, each leaf has a variable amount, users can trade tokens for to each other, but not split. Oh, oh no, users can split the tokens. That's not right. That's slide. Uh, and users can exit a leaf, but the leaf is. No, wait, that's not, this slide is wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let's talk about roll-up problems really quickly, and then, then we'll have some questions. Okay, so, so one, that, one problem is that the proving time is quite big, and we need to outsource this, as it's quite long. It takes, okay, so it takes about, it, ta it takes one hour and a half to prove on AWS, and it costs like um, $1,500, a little bit less than that. Uh, and we want to reduce this, and we think that we can reduce it, but it will get more expensive. Um, and then there's other ways to reduce it too. Instead of using the cluster, we can use GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs. And those are all open open areas of in, of research that or of implementations that I'm interested in talking to people about. If people are interested in doing that, that's cool. Come and we can talk about it. Um, can we add strong anonymity properties to this system? Um, that's another research question because everything, okay, everything is completely transparent here. Just because we use a snark to aggregate the data doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we still have the anonymity properties that we had before. Um, so, is it possible to add those anonymity properties back? That's another interesting question. Uh, so, we have optimizations. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. It's uh, this at snarks project have done a lot of work with. Uh, with these, these optimizations, this has moved forward quite quite well. Um, uh, also, ID IDN3 have another implementation. Uh, Ed Snacks are working on implementation. Uh, ID3 are working on implementation too. Um, yeah, and we're going to replace Chat256 with Pedersen commitments in some places. That's all. That's all good. So future work. Yeah, so we want to implement both approaches. Yeah, so if someone if there's if there's someone who's implement interested in implementing the other approach, the the SNASMA approach, we'd be interested in that too. Uh, so we're I'm interested in hearing about uh, generic uh, other use cases other than just scaling and tokens or tokens and stuff like that. I'd be interested to hear other use cases that we can use it to aggregate transactions together and aggregate like votes and things together. Uh, though that comes with a bunch of problems uh, still, but yeah, we could do that too. Uh, Non-fungible token, uh, maybe we can make an exchange with this. Uh, stack request. So this is like a request. So it would be good to have the gas cost reduced in the EVM. Uh, newer curve for more security would be nice. So we use all BM128 right now. It would be nice to move to BLS, the one that Zcash uses, and that means we could reuse a bunch of their, a bunch of their uh, signature schemes and stuff like that, and a bunch of their tools. And we could all just be working on the same curve. That would be great. Uh, and it would be good to have a hash function precompiled that that's efficient inside the snark, something like Pedersen commitments. That would be cool. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have time for maybe one or two questions. To okay, if, if, if people want to ask me more questions, I'll just hang out outside for a little while, and we can talk. Okay, okay so who has any questions? Yeah? You mentioned one possible use case is uh, quadratic voting. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have any like di design ideas about how you can um, ensure that someone doesn't um, have create multiple identities in order to skew mm -hmm. quadratic voting. OK. So there's like, there's like uh, some ideas about this. One thing we could do is, and it's a bit creepy, is we could use, like, uh, we could use uh, biometrics in order to limit the amount of people who are able to join our group. Uh, but this, is, this has problems, too, because people can just make fake biometrics. Yeah. So we'd have to have some kind of real-world biometric testing station, and that's not really very 
I don't know. That that has some problems. It's gameable. The other thing is that we could have a we could have this kind of uh, these kind of parties where everyone comes and you every every attendee is able to join the group, but but that kind of limits us because every attendee you could just get your friends to come and take their take their keys or take their position in the group. Another thing that we could do is we could have this like really high barrier to entry and say that you have to have accomplished X, Y, and Z in order to join. But that's not very good either because that means sort of limits the amount of people that can join and can be sort of commit to it. So yeah, I, I mean, it's sort of, it, it's a difficult problem, I think. And it's, uh, but it's one that's important to sort of figure out and solve. So I think a good approach would be to do like some sort of trusted hard hardware with, with some sort of biometric database or something like that. I mean, it's, it, it's, not, very, it's not very nice, but it could, if, if we need to do something like that, we could do that. Uh, the white T-shirt. He asked first, and then you can. Is it, is the uh, stuff that Starkware is working on? Could that potentially improve the uh, efficiency of this, or is it completely different? Uh, so they they would improve they would improve the proving time, but uh, uh, they would prove, improve the proving time. But the, currently the proofs are a little bit big, um, and it's still. I mean, I'm totally interested in in seeing what they have when 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 they sort of when they're ready for that. But it's still it's still moving forward. Um, I guess it would be good to talk to Abby Yu, who's here. He he sort of has some more more ideas about that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sorry, that's my time. Um, uh, if anyone wants to talk, I'll be outside. Yeah, for like the next thirty. 30 minutes. Thank you.